I guess we can start and then uh, people will join, then we'll ad keep admitting them. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. A very good afternoon to everyone present here. I'm Aishwarya and I have with me Vaishnavi, who will be the moderators for today's session. Welcome you all to 180DC Filter, organized by 180 degrees Consulting HR College. As Benjamin Franklin has said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. This is the quote we stand by here at 1T Degrees HR College. Being one of the first undergraduate consulting student community in the region, 1T Degrees strives to be a pioneer in knowledge creation and creating sustainable solutions for a better future. So what exactly is 1T Degrees Consulting? 1T Degrees provide socially conscious organizations around the world with high quality, extremely affordable consulting services. We work with organizations to develop innovative, practical and sustainable solutions to whatever challenges they are facing. One Degrees connect the untapped capabilities of the top university students with the unmet needs of the socially conscious organization. Our vision is to employ unconventional methods to create and sustain diverse business and non-business ecosystems. I will now like our principal, Dr. Pooja Ramchandani, ma'am, to grace us with a few words. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, dear. And um, a very, very nice, warm, good afternoon to all of you on this rainy day where uh, our guest speaker said that he's sitting in 42 degree temperature, but a warm welcome to HR virtually. I think uh, this, what we are uh, witnessing today, 180 DC, the HR chapter, I have to congratulate, I have to appreciate the brand ambassadors of HR college who took this initiative of bringing this 180 DC HR chapter in our college. I remember we had series of meetings with their mentor, Professor Kanu Priya Sharma, and the children and the way they were fighting that we want this chapter. And I said, why do you want this chapter in this college? You all don't study. You all have to now, this is your age to study. They said, no, this is our age to study and apply and apply in form of consultation. And this is where our children's confidence, our brand ambassadors thinking that they don't want to just study, but apply it right now at their first year, second years and third years at their undergraduate level itself. And today I'm very, very happy that they have got the head from the college and they are now going to learn tricks and traits of consultation from the best, Mr. Lokas, who have joined us today from Barcelona to understand how they work there so that our children can apply those internationally quality standards even to the things that they are going to apply in India. And I think virtually, maybe we should say Corona has been a blessing that today we can virtually meet and learn from each other. And I must say, thanks to Professor Kanupriya who have been heading this team. And today I can see around 20 to 25 students who want to really learn and how to do consultation. When I started, I told the, uh, the, the head of this group, the brand ambassador of mine, which is Ms. Omi, I told him, these sessions are good, but why can't you design a 30 hour program, a certificate program with heads of 180 DC across world and learn tricks and trades. And you know, our children will get how consultation in social entrepreneurship is done and we become consultants in the near future because the, the things don't change in consultancy, but you learn the tricks and the trade. So I believe my grand salute to all of you, my brand ambassadors for bringing 180 DC HR chapter live. And I believe they have done more than 10 programs in last one year and becoming more and more and more and more active. And I must wish 
all the best to you for your future endeavors and i should say may all the 22 are present here become the future consultants from hr college so all the best to all of you and looking forward to a session from 180 dc barcelona mr lucas and thank you for joining us in this virtual platform and i already invited him offline so please always when you are in mumbai hr is a place hr is your family that you have to visit and you have to meet us so over to you uh, dear and welcoming once again on behalf of hr college and hsnc university thank you thank you ma'am so i will like our faculty in charge kanupriya ma'am to please say yes thank you so um, i'm kanupriya and i am very very fortunate to be uh, the faculty advisor for 180 degree college uh, consulting at hr college uh, as the pooja ma'am you know rightly said that uh, she gave her blessings that all 24 students here today should become future consultants and i think that is not just a dream which they have but uh, i think pooja ma'am and i we share that dream along with them that each and every one who's attending the session each and every one who's participated in any of the previous sessions of 180 dc should become future consultants and um, you know through feedback that we've received from students who have graduated from hr college we've realized that consulting is one of the uh, stream that most students want to get into there are some students who have taken it up as a freelance career some want to be associated with uh, consultancy firms so nonetheless it is something which uh, students do feel inclined towards and uh, that's something which kind of was the driving force for us to start this uh, club at hr college i would say it's not just a club it's more than that it's a community of students who are working to improve themselves improve their skills um, you know from uh, being just uh, students who are gathering information they want to become students who are actually applying that information and uh, you know uh, um, kind of gaining experience through that and becoming more wise so i would say that it's a community of students trying to become wiser smarter more intellectually you know at a higher standards and um, uh, as teacher and principal we are always there to support them and uh, last but not the least i would like to welcome our speaker for today mr lucas um, we are really fortunate that you have been uh, associated with us on this online platform and uh, really looking forward to the session today uh, it's going to be a good learning experience for the students and for me also personally because i feel that international standards are something which we are always trying to achieve in education in our different uh, spheres of knowledge in uh, consultancy as well so your experience would be really valuable uh, in in making us understand the dynamics at an international level as well so really thankful for you for to join us and as ma'am said please do join us offline whenever you are in india mumbai uh, our students are there across india a lot of them are there abroad as well so we can make a good community of students who are learning from each other and we would really i highly appreciate if you could join us in mumbai sometime thank you over thank to you so ashwari thank you so much ma'am Now it is time for us to introduce you to our esteemed speaker for today. Today we have Mr. Lucas Yochem, who is a former consulting director of Vonity DC Barcelona. Lucas completed his B.Sc in Business Administration with a specialization in Finance from Winchester University. Then he not only completed M.Sc in Finance at Isade Business School at the top of his class, but also received M.Sc in C.E.M.S. International Management, having studied at Isade and H.E.C. Finance. He gained valuable experience from working at companies like Deloitte and PwC. Currently, he is a visiting associate at Boston Consulting Group at Dubai. I would now like to hand over the platform to our esteemed speaker and share with us how Vonetti DC gave him exposure to develop himself. Over to you, Lucas. Ishwarya, you just mute all. Yeah, just mute. One of the students is unmuted. Yeah. just mute everyone and keep the control with the co-host so that speaker is not disturbed omi keep a check yeah over to you wonderful thank you so much um 
I'm honored to be here today. I'm very happy to do this. Thank you also for the invitation to coming to Mumbai. Um, now that I, I live in Dubai and I'm actually a little bit closer, I do plan on exploring the region and, and stopping by in India as well, once perhaps the situation allows it. Then I'd be very happy and very, very honored to, to join you in person as well. Um, as of today, thank you so much for the kind introduction. You already took away you know, everything I wanted to say at the start. <laughs> um, but what I do want to say is, um, I see that some people have their cameras turned on, you know, that's, that's wonderful, that makes it more interactive to see people. So I encourage everybody who wants to turn on their cameras to do it, the more, the more people I see, the more fun I have with this. Um, and then adding on to this, I, I am a consultant now and we, we love to talk, you'll notice that as well, and I could hold monologues for hours. But I would love it if this became a bit more of an of an interactive session. So uh, do interrupt me if you have questions. You know, I think we have the, the raising your hand feature and so on. Just you know, if you want something in more detail, I'm I'm very happy to to stop in the middle and explain and and, and all this kind of stuff. So um, I didn't bring a fancy slide deck. I'm more here to to have a conversation. And of course, like I already said before, I did bring some time with me, so I'm happy to answer all the questions that might still be there at the end. So um, starting off, you already outlined my background a little bit. I was very fortunate to study in Barcelona and in Paris the past two years. And uh, yeah, when I, I came to Barcelona there, I heard about 180 degrees consulting for the first time. Obviously Google did, saw what a, what a wonderful brand it was, saw what they did, really started to like their work. And in my first year in Barcelona, I applied as a team lead and fortunately I got it. It was in Barcelona, it was crazy. They hired about 40 people um, and they had almost 200 applications. So there was a very severe process about only getting the, the best students in there, which I guess was, was fortunate for us. Um, and there to, to also say this, this upfront now, um, I know that you, you recently started your branch and I'm not sure like what kind of you know, I, I could talk for hours and hours about this. So I'll just give a, a relatively general outline about how it worked for us and what we did. And then we can we can go into detail about everything that that you're interested in, or that you feel that you feel adds the most value to you. So yeah, um, back to my story, I joined as a team lead and there it worked in the way that we had eight consultant teams, always one team lead and three consultants on them. Um, and this was pre Corona. So at that point, the projects were almost exclusively in Barcelona was nice because then we, we got to meet the clients in person as well. Um, and uh, I, I led a project that was with a, with a small startup in Barcelona. And what they were doing was they developed these sort of little black bags that you could use in supermarkets. Um, instead of always taking a new plastic bag for your fruits and vegetables, you could buy one of these nice ones and then always just carry this one with you. So they had this social mission, um, but they were still a more or less profit driven startup at that point. And uh, this is what you're going to discover. A, a lot of the startups and a lot of the NGOs, they usually have the same issues. They bring in a lot of bright ideas. They want to change the world. They want to be sustainable. They want to help the people who, who are struggling. Um, and at the same time, they, they lack business knowledge and they, they're not really sure how to run a business uh, in a profitable and, and, and sustainable fashion. And that's especially where we came in there. And uh, what we did for these guys was they, they, they had the business, they were producing, they were selling and so on, um, but they didn't have a brand and they didn't really know how to develop a brand. So they hired us as 180DC and then our mission was to, to create this branding strategy for them. Um, and this is very typical because uh, the, the, like I said, the, the startups and the NGOs, um, they, they don't push their resources into the into the, the, the areas that don't give them immediate value. So marketing, branding, and these kind of these kind of things, they often fall off the table. So that's when when 180 often gets involved and, and does this kind of stuff, which is interesting because I have no marketing experience whatsoever. And I had a team with an engineer and a finance student and uh, actually two engineers and two finance students was us. And then we did this marketing and branding project for them. And this is already the, the first beauty of 180 that you just like in real world consulting, you get involved in a lot of topics that you don't know about so much at the start. And then you, you learn on the go and in the end you, you deliver value. 
And in that sense, our project was, was relatively typical. We have a somewhat standardized approach to how we did projects in Barcelona. Um, you meet the client, you get to know the issue, you know, all this, this typical stuff. Um, and then what we always did was we developed an issue tree. So I'm sure you're aware of these sort of tree structures where you have the one big problem, the branding strategy, and then you break it down into all these components. So that's exactly what we did there as well. And we said, all right, branding, you know, we need the image, we need to show the world what it is, but we also need to discuss a lot of, a lot of options. So the, the production costs were very high. So we said, all right, you know, we can't, we can't brand this as a product for everybody. We have to brand this as a sort of premium product here. Otherwise we can't justify the, the high prices um, and so on. And this is how we, we always structured the problem. And after that, we, we started getting into the, the information collection. Um, and here, we, this is the, probably the most challenging bit um, of finding a way to, to deliver the value to actually solve the problem for them. And uh, we split the, the work up within our team. And we had one, one of our engineers who was surprisingly creative. And she developed this, this beautiful branding strategy for, for this plastic bag in the supermarket. And you know, it was all black. And she had this you know, little black dress from the, the French haute couture. That was the idea at the end. Um, and then we sold it as a very Catalan, Barcelona thing, the beautiful beaches, the, the wonderful weather, the great food, this mindset, we tried to associate all that with the back and that was the brand there at the end. And then we also had to think about how do we price it so that it actually fits into the segment. Um, so what we did was we, we ran a survey with about 300 people in Barcelona. Again, this is a very, very common procedure to collect the information that you need um, just to find out, you know, how high is the willingness to pay for, for these kind of things. Um, and then it turned out that people were actually willing to pay a little bit more than it, than it previously cost. And then we thought, oh, well, maybe we can raise the price. But, you know, we, we need it. You always need to back it up. You can't just run a survey and then say, oh, you know, some people said this and that. So we're going to we're going to recommend this now. So what we did in that case was we tried to take data that we could you know find for our university databases or on the internet and put that into relation with with the problem that we were facing there so we looked at competitors we looked at other products that were in the market there were not that many in spain but there were some in italy there were some in the uk there were some in france some in germany and so on and then we just did a benchmarking we saw you know how do these others look uh, do, in what batches do they sell them for what price do they sell them all these kind of things and then you run into more issues and as in a consultancy you always run into more issues because you realize that uh, the purchasing power in germany is a lot higher than it is in spain so you know people earn more money they might be willing to spend more on a bag like this than they are in spain so you can't just compare it one to one. So then we had to look at some other international metrics and we looked at the GDP of a country and we looked at the mean national income and the gross and the net and so on. Then we built a sort of a sort of average out of all these factors and then we multiplied that with the prices for our bags and then applied that to Spain. Um, and then we got a decent idea of for how much we could sell a bag like this in Spain and we combined that with our survey. And in the end, we were able to give the recommendation that they should, should increase the prices a little bit. And the uh, yeah, so this was this was in a very short overview of what we did for this project and how we came from, you know, the problem that they faced to the solution. Um, obviously, it's not a linear process. We ran into a bunch of challenges on the way. Um, the first is that you're also going to find out you always struggle with is communication. So the startup was run by by two ladies, the founder and a friend of hers, and she was in the process of selling the, the startup to her friend. Um, so we understood it in the way that, you know, this, this new lady, she was going to take over and that she was to be our primary point of contact. And then as it turned out, in the end, it wasn't sold. Um, this lady, she, she jumped ship. Um, she was not our primary point of contact. And the, the original founder was, was very disappointed, actually, in us at the start, that we didn't involve her as much and that we just misread the situation and, and completely misunderstood this. And that, that got us off to a bad start. And it, it took us a little while to rectify that. Then another problem that, that we always run into is that, you know, university is quite challenging and it does take a lot of time. And this is a, a volunteering effort. So if you have people that are, that are dedicating their free time for this and then there's an exam coming up, then the majority of them is going to prioritize their exam. Um, and this was also tricky for me as the team lead in that case, because I had three people there and I needed to motivate them to do this because everything they didn't do in the end, I had to do it. So, you know, it stuck with me. It was in my own interest. I had exams as well. And you really had to find the right balance between 
getting people to do the work, um, highlighting the experience that they're going to get, um, and still letting them pursue their degrees and you know, not, not screwing up the other important parts of their life. And, yeah. And a third, a third component here that always happened, just like in real consulting, most of the work is done towards the end, not only because people are, are procrastinating, but because it takes a while to really understand what the client wants and how to solve it and to gather the information. And in the end, writing the report uh, for a week, I stayed up until 3 a.m. every day, just, just working on this. And, you know, on the one hand, you can say, wow, you know, why, why would anybody do that voluntarily? That sounds, that sounds like a nightmare. Um, so much work, uh, so little actual return, if you want to call it like this. But it was very fulfilling for me personally. And uh, it's great preparation for real world consulting later on. Sorry, I don't want to burst any bubbles here. Um, but in this sense, it really was an accurate representation of what you might be expecting later on in your life. So this much, just a, a brief overview of the first project. Um, I then uh, stayed with 180 DC Barcelona. I was supposed to do my internship at DCG in the last summer, but then COVID happened. I couldn't travel to Dubai. So I suddenly had a, a few weeks off. So I, I rejoined 180 uh, as a consulting director on the board. And we really grew the organization in the last year. I think we had around 85 people in there, um, up to 60 consultants. We did, uh, don't let me lie, around 20 projects this year. So we really the, the whole thing exploded and uh, it was really wonderful to once again get a different perspective on all of this because suddenly you're not the one on the ground talking to the clients consulting them doing the project but you're a bit further up and you're managing other people that are doing the projects and suddenly you need to keep track of three four five different projects uh, you know the students they have their issues and they, you're their point of contact and they come to you and you have to deal with with all these sorts of things and at the same time you know i was very involved with running the actual organization so we were 10 at the end 11 people on our board you know and there were issues you know the strategy where do we take 180 how do we want to grow further um, what we did was we became 180 dc barcelona instead of 180 dc Sade and open it up to other universities in the city to really grow it because we said you know we, we care about diversity so we can't just hire from from one university um, we introduced mentorship programs we we really we we did a bunch of stuff and, and uh, that really is a, is a completely different perspective from the actual real world consulting, the, the running the organization and managing this many people at the same time. And personally, I can't say which one, which one I like more, but I was very happy that I, that I got to do both in this regard. And I think that's, that's honestly enough as a brief overview of, of what we did there. And I say brief, and I think I already talked for almost 15 minutes. Um, I know that uh, before this, I was sent a few talking points and I, I would like to go into a bit more detail onto those. Um, and this was mainly sort of in the direction of what I learned during this time, the skills that I gathered and, and how they helped me later down the line. Because obviously, you know, we, uh, we join 180 DC because we want to have an impact and we want to change the world. But on the other hand, you know, there's a lot of personal benefits to be gained from this as well, even from a very, very egoistic perspective in that case. And, and the first one is obviously that I, I, I got to put it on my CV, which was wonderful. And this is, nobody's ever going to tell you in an interview, I'm applying to 180 because, you know, I want to improve my CV, but, you know, they all have it in the back of their minds. And it's, it's an important part. If you want to apply to a top consulting firm, then, then you need to have done something social. It's not enough to have good grades and previous experience. You need to, you need to be special in some way. And 180 DC is a wonderful way to be special because the brand is big and if you do it properly then then you learn so much there and future employers they they will value that however if you just apply for cv reasons then you're not you're not suitable like you you don't fit with with the character of the organization um and you're going to be one of the people who prioritizes exams over getting the projects done and this is not that is not the spirit of of 180 so just as a a click a quick disclaimer there then moving on to what, what I actually learned in this time, um, I learned a lot of leadership skills, actually, first as team lead, then as consulting director. Um, people are so different and they all have, they all have different issues. Um, and you need to deal with so many at once. You need to motivate them. You need to make sure they get along. You need to delegate appropriately so that they can work independently. And at the same time, you can't just say, here, do this and you know, see you in two weeks. And I, I hope you did it right. Because then you're the one who is who's responsible at the end. Um, and 
this was a wonderful opportunity because if you do an internship now, if you join a company, if you if you want to get some real world experience, um, in the end you're not going to, you're not going to gather that much leadership experience because they're not going to hire an intern and say here's a project you know take care of this, um, and that's where where 180 really really comes in handy. And even if you're not a team lead, even if you work as a, as a consultant, um, you have to work very independently. There's nobody that always watches, you know, what exactly you're doing. You, you still have to be proactive. You still have to do a lot of these typical things that are part of, of, of leading a team, even if you're, if you're just leading yourself in that regard. So um, definitely this, this leadership aspect is a, is a big, big thing. And companies love it, you know. If you come on there, they always ask you questions about how you demonstrated leadership skills somewhere in your interview. It's it's a super important part. So um, that would be the first one. Mm. Then you learn a lot of just general things that you you pick up along the way. You learn a lot about prioritization. You learn a lot about time management because if you have your exams coming up and you know the client is expecting the final report and the presentation in two weeks you're not going to have time to get everything done perfectly and this is exactly how it works in consulting as well you always have too much work and you have too little time and you really learn how to prioritize how to say you know this is this is key here this is where i have the most impact with the least amount of time you know you do want to sleep a, a few hours a day as well and this is you, you learn how to fit it in there and you learn how to be really efficient and you learn how to be quick and solving things. And at the end, like I said, it helps in consulting, but it also helps everywhere else in your life and in, in dealing with dealing with the challenges. And then this is more of, a, of an Isade experience. I don't know to what extent it, it applies to, to your wonderful university in Mumbai as well. Um, Isade was super international. Um, so what happened was you had, I had, I'm German and I had a French guy on my team, a girl from Lebanon and a guy from, from Serbia, all with different backgrounds, all with different ideas about how to work together, different ideas, you know, in communication, in directness. And I really, on the one hand, that made it more challenging. On the other hand, that made it such a fantastic experience because the output just gets, just gets better as teams are diverse. And once again, it was a great learning experience for me. So as Germans, you know, you know, the stereotype, we are very direct in our communication. You're probably noticing it right now, even as I'm speaking this, you know, I just, uh, we are very straight to the point and we're very honest in this regard. Um, and some of my team members, they, they weren't like this. And it took us a little while to, to get along and find the right balance in this. And at the end, of course, we had a, a large feedback session to really take away the most. They told me, hey, you know, we'd have appreciated if you could have made a little more small talk at the start of the meetings, felt like, you know, you're building a relationship instead of just, you know, oh, okay, let's get this done. And then we, then we all go home to, to state it in a bit of a, an exaggerated fashion. And once again, that's great because now I'm working in Dubai. I'm not working in Germany. And here the culture is completely different. Here we have a lot of internationals as well. And if I just came here with my direct German attitude, then, well, I, I would run into a bunch of issues as well. So there's a lot of learning and self-reflection going on, going on in that sense. And then um, to, to keep going with, uh, with the list of things you learn and pick up along the way. Um, yeah, okay. No problem. Um, I had no idea about the world of social impact before. I've done internships. I was at Deloitte before and you named some of the companies. It was always the corporate world. I had no idea about startups. I had no idea about NGOs. I didn't really know what kind of issues the social sector was facing. So just for me personally, it was extremely interesting to, to get involved in that regard and to learn about this. And it's like a window to a new world. And what actually happens is, and we experienced this as well. So for me, it didn't happen, but for many others, they realize, wow, you know, like this is where I see my purpose. This is where I want to be in life. I don't want to just do corporate projects for corporate clients and earn as much money as possible and, you know, sacrifice my weekends for it. But they say, if I want to make a difference, I want to go into the social world. And 180DC really is a, is a great enabler in this sense to, to get you there, to get to know it and to, to fall in love with it. And I know that some of my peers on the board and some people that I was working with they now changed their, their career plans and they're going more in this direction. I mean, that's fantastic because we need more people like this to, to, to make the world a better place. Um, and yeah, to round it off, 
once again, a bit of an Isadi factor. What happened with us was, I don't know to what extent it applies to you. We, I studied finance and I hung out with finance people. Those were the people I had my classes with, those were my friends. Um, I rarely had the opportunity to interact with, with people from other programs. And again, at 180, the teams are diverse, we mixed them. So, you know, you have people from other programs there that you would not usually meet. So you expand your own personal network, you, you, make, you make new friends, you, you get new, new experiences and so on. Um, and that's just wonderful. It's, it's a great opportunity to, to get outside of your bubble and to really, really interact with others. And I guess finally, the, the point is I, I had a lot of fun actually. Um, you know, it's challenging at times and you, you curse your, yourself when you can't sleep because you have to work and you have to do this and you have to do that. Um, but in the end, it is consulting. And if you like consulting and if you see a career for yourself in there, then you're going to enjoy the experience and you're going to enjoy talking to people. You know, you have to be very open and communicative and presenting and you're, you're going to love to do that. You're going to love finding out what the problems are for others and then to, to come up with these innovative solutions. And you feel special because you are there because you can do this. You're a student and you've just studied and you might not have too much experience, but still there's a real life, real life company there that needs you. And in the end, you, you deliver a solution to them and you, you add value and you do this with a great team. And, and that's, a, that's a wonderful experience that you can't, you just can't get that anywhere. And if you do an internship in, in some corporate company, you're not going to get it. And just in your studies, you're not going to get it. And 180DC really, really enables this. And uh, yeah, I think that, that sums it up for the skills there. Um, and obviously all of this really, it helps you move forward in life at the end. So if you, if you apply to a company, of course, it's going to be in your CV and they say, oh, 180, nice, maybe we should invite this guy or this girl. Um, but it goes much further because you have a lot more to talk about in your interview because you have a lot more experiences and you face some crises and some challenges and you had to work with different team members and you had to solve all these problems. And that really, it, it develops your character and you can display that in the interview, but also in, in the actual work process at the end, it will it will massively help you to deal with the challenges that you face in your consulting job every day. Um, and it prepares you. And it's, I, I don't know, I feel like I'm just going on and on about how wonderful it, it is at this point. And I can, I can wrap it up a little bit, but I, you can see that I'm passionate about it. And I really loved it. And I'm a bit sad that now that I'm working in other student anymore, I can't be part of 180 anymore, because it was just that much of a special experience for me. And I think I'm going to stop my monologue here um, because I, I covered all the topics that I wanted to cover. And now I would love it if you, I would love to answer all of your questions and then deep dive into the, the parts that you feel like are the most relevant for you or that, that interest you the most. Mm -hmm. Sure, I have one question. Like, what encouraged you to join Vanity DC exactly? Um, there was a, a mixture of factors. So what actually happened was that my roommate came up to me and he said, hey, you know, I saw this one ATDC, check it out on this website. Doesn't it look great? We both wanted to go into consulting. And I said, oh, hey, you know, that's, that's pretty good. I'll have a look at that. It's a little ironic because I got accepted and he didn't at the end. Um, but he, you know, there's, there's no hard feelings on that side. Um, and then what, what encouraged me, first of all, was because I wanted, to, I wanted to go into consulting. I had some experience, but not enough. So this was a great opportunity to collect some more of it. Um, it was a great opportunity to learn about the social sector that I had very little knowledge about. I think it's always good to look outside your bubble and to, to try to learn about the things that you don't know about yet. So it was this. It was the opportunity of meeting some people that I would otherwise not have met. Mm -hmm. And finally, it was just in a way for others, but also for myself. So I've done not too much charity work before in my life. And I really like the, the opportunity to, to do it there. And it just, you know, it feels good to help others. And this was, this was a great opportunity to connect, learning about consulting, meeting people, and still doing something positive for, for your community and your environment. And that was, I couldn't pass that up. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. I guess there is one question in the chat box. Can you answer it? I'm sorry, I didn't see that before. It's my bad. 
Um, no, let's just please switch on your camera, but I see in your chat. Yeah, yeah, it was direct the message. Okay, what are our responsibilities exactly? Um, do you mean as a consultant, as a team lead, as a member of the board, or in what sense? As a consultant. As a consultant. Um, so, <laughs> what will happen as a consultant is that you work in a team of four or five people with your team lead, um, and you have this problem, let's say developing a marketing strategy for a company, and then that problem gets broken down into its, into its components. So they will be developing, for example, a target persona, um, doing a benchmarking with other firms in the test, um, analyzing the, the traffic on the website, uh, whatever. And then you as a consultant, you most likely one part of this analysis will be delegated to you. So let's say um, I might be responsible for checking out the market, doing the benchmarking. Um, and then I'll be looking at, at similar companies. I'll be looking at, I see some more and more questions here and the raised hand, I'll get, I'll get to all of it, I promise. Um, and uh, so that would be when I do the benchmarking, I look at the competitors, I do this and that and that, and I compile the information um, and I come up with some recommendations as well for it. So I see, you know, here's, here's my company and here's what the others are doing. And this is what the company we're consulting is doing well. This is what it's not doing so well. And I find these issues and I come up with solutions for it. That's, that's the consultant part. And then in the end, um, these get compiled into one big report. So they get connected with the others. So whoever, I don't know, looked at social media and what you find, found out in benchmarking about how to do it better, you, you connect it. Um, but then obviously it doesn't, it doesn't end with the analysis, your responsibility as a consultant, you're responsible for writing that part of the final report that covers it then. And usually the, 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 there's a presentation to be given at the end to the client. And then it's your, your, your responsibility as a consultant to present your work and the, how you went about the analysis and your findings and to, to give a convincing argument about why the client should do it in this way at the end. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Great. When I see, I think Ria, you had your hand raised before the, yeah. the question was in the chat. Sure. Yeah. So before I initiate asking my question, first of all, thank you so much for all of these pre insights that you're giving all, all of us right now. So I wanted to ask that right now, and we are just stepping into the world of consulting. Like it's just first day of our college and we're in second year, planning to get into all of this consulting industry so what are the prerequisite knowledge things like there could be some informational things of course not books because they say that consulting is a lot practical but there would be some topics or something that you would want us to have a little knowledge about to be able to get into the whole field work of consulting okay you mean in terms of 180 in terms of um, real firm consultancies or just in general yeah. consulting i i, okay. I mean both 180 DC and on the lines of consulting as an industry. Okay, um, sure. Well, that's a, not an easy question to just answer, but I'll do my best here. Um, in the end, the, the wonderful thing about consulting is that you don't actually really need to know anything because in the end, when you consult the client, you go into their company and of course they know the industry better and they know their business better and you're an outsider and you haven't studied what they have studied and you haven't worked in that before. Um, so it's much less about what you, what you learn before and it's much more about the, the skills you develop and this mindset that you have. Um, and to be a good consultant, um, you need really strong analytical skills. For example, you really need to, it doesn't matter if it's 180 or BCG or whatever, um, you really need to be able to see the problem, to, to understand it, to break it down, to see, you know, um, this is just a symptom, here's the root cause. Um, and then, then to come up with a solution for it, it's, it's, all, it's all analytical skills. It's all, how do, I, how do I get from where we are now to, to where this company needs to go? So that's, that's one part, you, you need to be analytical like this. And the second one is, you really, you need to be a great communicator. Um, in all ways, on the one hand, because you're working in a team and you, you always work with this team and you work long hours with them um, and there's no way to avoid them. And after three months, you'll be thrown into a different team and you'll be working with completely different people. And, you know, it might be very different from what you're used to. And you need to quickly get into this and you need to quickly be able to work 
with these people. So internally, this, this teamwork and this communication in between is, is super crucial, but also externally, because you work with a bunch of different clients and they, they care about different things and they, they have different mentalities and different values and you need to quickly understand this. And uh, obviously, you know, don't, don't insult them, make sure you're, you're respectful and so on so that the client is happy. But in the end, you need to extract a lot of information from them. And if you just ask them, so, you know, um, you hired us, so what's the problem exactly? They, they are not able to tell you, you need to, you need to extract that. And for that, you need to be a great communicator. And finally, it's always about selling first yourself and then your solution at the end. So you need to be able to, to present your findings and communicate them in a very convincing fashion. So if you just stand there and you go, oh, and then please, you know, do this and after and then, no, you need to, you need to have fire. You need to, you need to be passionate. Um, and a lot of this is, is practice. You can practice how to be analytical. You can practice how to communicate. Um, I can, I can add more points here. You need to be independent. There's, there's, there, you know, you don't always have somebody watching your back telling you do this, do this, do that. In the end, it's, it's your job to come up with a solution, even, even if you're just a consultant or just an intern at a consulting firm and so on. Um, so it's much more about these, these skills that you bring in there rather than about uh, learning something. And of course you can, you can learn, you, you said books are, are, are not ideal and I would agree. Um, of course you can learn something about from books. You can learn, or you know, you don't move your hands too much when you talk or, you know, stand straight when you present and, and all these kinds of things. But in the end, you learn it because you, you apply it and you, you do it and you practice it and you give presentations at university and you give presentations for your client at 180DC and so on. And it just, it just steps up in this way. Hmm. I hope that that answered your question a little bit. Uh, yeah, that absolutely does. I just had a follow up if I could go ahead. Okay, sure. Hmm. Yeah. So um, the whole insight that you said was about when you're actually doing consulting, which is slowly noted down. And I assume that you must have given a lot many guesstimates and a lot many case interviews. So while I was watching a few guesstimates that I went, while I was solving a few case studies, there was a hurdle that I faced that at that point of time, there, there were a lot many industries that I had absolutely no knowledge about. And no matter how much I Googled them all, I, I was not sure that. And obviously, because I didn't have a mentor at first, while like let's just say for an DC as well, when I applied for my own consulting case, at that point of time, I had no one exactly to be able to guide me. And all I could do was to go through resources and for industries where you have absolutely no knowledge about so in situations like these how do you make sure that you're able to come to a common consensus or maybe take put out something substantive enough to be able to present okay um, that's a very difficult question <laughs> thank you for asking it though um, uh, it's hard to where do I start here so first of all um, yeah industries are always different but they also always have a lot in common. You know, in the end, if you want to run a business, it has to be profitable. And if it's unprofitable, you either need to, to increase your revenues or you need to decrease your costs. And that, that holds for, let's say, 99% of all industries. Um, so you don't go in there thinking, okay, you know, like this is an airline now or this is a utility company or, or whatever. So you go in there thinking, all right, you know, I need to find out, you know, where the problem is to does it cost them too much to to produce or to offer their services do they do they not generate enough revenues and this it holds for for like i said pretty much any company and at that point you're already one step further because you already know what to look for then and then as you go deeper yeah like like you said it's it's tricky sometimes you can't just google it and find all the information that you need on the industry you can find some high level information um, but in the end it's, it's still limiting. So I can tell you what happens in a real firm or I don't want to say real firm. So what happens at VCG is they have a, an insane amount of knowledge resources that you can access. We have external experts that you can ask and interview. So they really, they invest a lot of money into, into be, making sure that consultants have all the resources they need to understand the industry and to solve the issues. Um, at 180 DC, it is a little bit different, of course, because I mean, it's pro bono, so you can't spend a thousand dollars an hour to talk to some external experts so that, that you understand it better. Um, but that's fine, because um, 
the client doesn't expect you to do this. The organization doesn't expect you to do this. Um, in the end, it's about doing your best and producing the best, the best possible output that you can. Um, and you're able to do this even with incomplete information. You, you make smart assumptions. Um, you justify these assumptions. You, you look at what other firms are doing, even if you don't understand it completely. You always find a sort of a workaround on, on how to approach it. And that's, I think that's probably the, the most difficult part and the, the most difficult part on our project as well, finding, finding this workaround. And while some things are standard, others are not, and you always need to come up with, with something special for every client. And I'm not sure if I, if I answered the gist of your question, but I hope I, I got somewhere close to it. Absolutely, that aside, you did. Okay. Hi, Lucas, I have a question, can I? Um, there was one in the chat. I don't know if I, if I like the poor Yusuf has been waiting for a while now. So sure, I would answer that one first, but then I'm very happy to answer yours as well. Sure. Um, so where, wherever I can describe the satisfaction I derive after consultation or solving a problem for someone. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to put in words in a way, but uh, like imagine there's, you know, one of your good friends at university and they're struggling with an exam and then you study with them and you help them prepare. And in the end, you know, they, they pass the exam and they're able to, to continue their studies. So, you know, obviously they will feel great about it, um, but you'll feel great about it yourself as well because you enabled them and you, you helped them to do this. Um, and now imagine this on, on a bit of a bigger scale where it's not just your friend with an exam, but it's, a, it's a, an NGO or a small company or something that can now continue its operations for a few more years and to, to continue to like, change the world is maybe a little bit dramatic. Um, and you know that you're part of a team that, that enabled this. So that it, it's satisfaction on, on a whole new level, if, if, you wanna, if you wanna call it that. I, I'm not sure if I can, I can describe it any better. Um, describing emotions is not my strength here, but it feels very, very good. Mm -hmm. um, all right, now, if, if I can answer your question, Jeet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, so first of all, thank you so much for doing this. It is absolutely like really helpful. And uh, so my question is, uh, so how can we get internship straight after uh, our undergraduation? Because uh, in India, like, uh, I'm not sure, like only IITs and people from uh, MBA colleges uh, get into uh, like uh, big consulting firms. So like, how can we get into these consulting firms straight after undergraduation? Okay. Um, I'm gonna reach out a little bit to, to answer this question. So consulting, there are a bunch of, of different levels of consulting. So right at the top, you have MBB. I don't know if that's what you meant with big firms. You have McKinsey, you have BCG, and you yes. have Fain. Yeah. Um, the, the short answer is you, you can't just get into them. That's, that's not how it works. You need to bring in a very diversified profile. You need like good education, good grades, previous experience in consulting, show that you did some social work and still be special in some way when you get invited and then do great in the interviews and then, then you can make it there. Um, and the thing is, it's, it's, you, you can't, it's like saying, okay, you know, I, I would like to become a professional footballer tomorrow. It, it, you can't just, you can't do it in a day, it's a process. So what you would do is um, throughout your undergrad, you, you can apply to these firms, see maybe you get super lucky, um, but you would probably go to a smaller boutique consulting firm, you know, some, not, not a big name necessarily, um, but just so, something in your area focused on one industry. Um, and you'd learn the ropes, you'd, you'd understand how consulting works, you'd collect your first experiences and so on, you'd, you'd have something to talk about. Um, then probably you would do a second internship or something like this in a much bigger firm. So for example, this was exactly the process for me. So I went to Deloitte. So, you know, big four, huge companies, they have large consulting divisions. They're growing like crazy. They're looking for smart, talented young people. And if you go over and say, I have good grades and I did something for 180DC and I already have some previous consulting experience, then, you know, unless you, you do terrible in the interview, they'll be quite happy to, to take you along for the ride. And then you get exposure to what it's like to work in a big company and to have these big corporate clients and you, you get your first real project experience and you learn from this as well and you develop and you grow as a person. And then finally, once you're done with all of this, then you go to NBB and you apply there and uh, then you'll get, you'll get invited to the interviews and have your shot. And to finish the thing about right after undergraduate, um, they have some policies that they don't hire undergraduate so you need you need a master's degree 
And this, this always depends. So what some people do is, and I know this because my, my new cohort here um, that, that I met in the past few days, for some of them it's true, they, they have an undergraduate degree, then they go work in an unrelated industry for a few years, do an MBA, and then they switch to consulting. So if you want to do consulting right now, that's not really the way to go. They have some junior associate positions here where they basically they, they give you a shot. And, um, but then after two years, you have to leave and you have to do your master's degree to be promoted and be a regular associate or business analyst. So to get to the to the entry level here. Um, other than that, my, my recommendation would just be go go to the big four or, find, or, or do like Accenture or there's, there's a bunch of consulting firms on all levels that, that you will get into even with, with less experience, collect the experience and then during or after your master's degree, you, you apply to MBB and then, then you'll have your shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. This was really helpful. Glad to hear it. All right. Are there any other questions? This is your opportunity. I'm happy to answer anything, not just about 180, but consulting. I see that somebody unmuted themselves right now. I, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name. Okay. Looks like that was an accident. No. Yeah, okay. Uh, we have questions. So in today's okay. world, um, in today's world, everybody thinks about lucrative investment banking job and its monetary benefits. So why did you choose being a consultant, although you had studied finance as well? Okay, that's interesting because actually one of my BCG interviews, the, the interviewer asked me this question as well. <laughs> um, there's, um, the, the answer is quite multifold. So the first one, the first part of the, the most important part for me is I like working with people and I like helping them solve their problems. So if I had gone into investment banking, I'd be sitting behind my Excel spreadsheet crunching numbers for the majority of the day. And it would be, it would be less about uh, you know, solving problems, meeting people, having diverse clients and, and all this kind of stuff. So that's the, the probably the, the most important part. And, and you're right, there, there are some similarities between consulting and investment banking. Um, usually the, the, the best and brightest go there. Um, so you have a very good cohort of, of other people around you. Um, you earn a lot of money and you have nice benefits at the start. Um, and if you want to exit into a different industry after, then if you did banking or consulting, you're going you're gonna to have great opportunities. But um, like I said, if you want to work with people instead of just crunching numbers, I would recommend consulting. And while they both can be a little bit extreme, consulting is better. In, in that way. I have a friend who did an internship at Goldman Sachs and he worked 110 hours every week. And, you know, I'm, I'm willing to work a lot, but I don't want to, to give up all my social life and all my free time and my friends just, just for a job. And in consulting, if you go there, you, you're not going to work 40 hours and you're going to have your intense weeks where you do 70 or 80 hours of work a week, but it's not over a hundred. And they, they usually give you the weekend off and, and you have these kind of things. So the work-life balance is a little better there been in banking and in the end it was the, the combination of these factors that that made me choose consulting um, uh, so, so while you said that there have been so many perks of doing consulting so what do you think apart from the proper apart from the rhetorical graduation degree and maybe masters what could be the degrees that could facilitate when you are actually getting into consulting is that related to finance or marketing precisely or okay that's very interesting. Um, the nice thing about consulting is that they usually hire from almost all backgrounds. So um, I think about 50% of the new hires have a background in business administration or economics or in some way. And the others just come from elsewhere. Usually they, they like engineers because consulting can be very quantitative and it's about structured problem solving. And if you're an engineer, then, then you bring a lot of this with you. Um, but it, it, it can be anything. If you study law, you, you'll have a good chance. But even if you're, even if you're a bit of an outsider or something, you know, you have a degree in philosophy or you have a degree in music or or something like this that's way off the books. Um, there are some firms that that appreciate this as well. So, for example, BCG they hire a lot of people with 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 backgrounds like this. So you may have an undergraduate degree in, in something that is that is unrelated when you have like a degree in management after or something that gives you a little bit of business um, and you, you have an interesting profile, then they'll be happy to hire you. 
because they like hiring people that think outside the box and they like it, you know, they, they don't just want 100% business graduates that all learned the same thing and then, you know, all do the same thing. Um, so I, I, I can tell you if, if it's something that's, that's quantitative, it will probably give you a bit of an edge. And, and if it has some form of business component, then, then that also gives you an edge. Um, but in the end, you can, you can become a consultant with almost anything. A little bit of a disclaimer, some firms, VCG is an example, they value this. So they will hire from diverse backgrounds. McKinsey is a little different. They, they are more, more standardized in this sense. So if you want to go there, probably business or engineering, or otherwise you'll, you'll, have, you'll have a tough time. But this depends. That answered my question. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, a small follow-up question on the investment banking lines. So how would you sure. differentiate between the skill sets required to become a consultant versus an investment banker? Since this question seems to be, uh, people seem to be hesitant to ask this question. Okay. Um, so I've never worked in investment banking. So I have quite a few friends who did it and I know what they're like. Um, but, uh, so, but so I'll try to answer them the best way possible. If you go into investment banking, it's, it's finance. You need to love numbers. You need to be able to crunch numbers for days on end. You need to see a balance sheet, an income statement, a cash flow statement. You see that and you feel at home. You look at it and you already spot the little details that seem off to you. And you need to love sitting in front of your spreadsheet and building this, this leverage buyout model for 16 hours a day. And, and this, so you need to have this this amazing feeling for numbers. And um, of course, you also need, you need analytical skills to, to be able to understand what, what's going on there and what's wrong. And you need to have this passion for, for diving into the nitty gritty details of this, this financial stuff. That, that I would say is the, the big thing about investment banking. And in consulting, of course, a lot of that still holds as well. You need the analytical skills. You need to understand finance. You need to feel comfortable with, with, with all this kind of stuff. Um, but you need, you need much less of it. You don't need to go into such detail. Um, and you need, to, you, need to, you need to have other skills as well. So if you just crunch numbers in your Excel spreadsheet, it doesn't matter as much if you're a great presenter and you can convince your client of something or not. Um, so this is more of a, more of a consulting, consulting mindset. But a lot of uh, willing to work hard, analytical skills, structured way of thinking and approaching problems that, that, holds, for, that holds for both. Mm. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah, so uh, next one, um, could you tell us like how, about a day in the life of a concert and how usually a day looks like? Okay, so not 180 DC, but now we're we're talking about the about after. Okay. Yeah, um, your current profile. Okay, so it always depends on the project and the people that you work with. But in general, um, usually you'll start working around nine. So they, they don't get up at seven unless you have a client meeting at nine. That that still needs to be prepared, um, and then. Most of the times you have a daily meeting with your team where you just check in, how's everybody doing, you know, uh, like uh, what are they working on? What's the progress that has been made? Share the slides. Um, and then it depends very much on, on the position that you're in. So if you're a business analyst or an associate or even a consultant at the start, um, you'll spend time going through databases. You'll spend time researching. You'll spend time perhaps talking to the client. Um, Nowadays, with COVID, there's less client interaction. Usually, you'd spend like Monday to Thursday at the client side, sitting in their offices, talking to them. Now that it's it's remote, there's a little bit less of that. Um, and in the end, you if you do something in Excel, you'll be working on your model. If you if you're getting closer to to presenting something, you'll be working on the PowerPoint slides. Um, this this kind of stuff. That's that's what you will do for most of the day once you start in consulting. And every once in a while, you'll have meetings with your with your fellow consultants to make sure that you're you're still aligned. You'll ask for feedback um, from your project leader. Um, it's it it really depends. Um, for example, here, um, what they what they do is they say, okay, at the start of every project, they they discuss how this is approached, and then they say, all right, we start working at nine in the morning, and we say between 
uh, 3 and 4.30 every day, we take a break. And if you want to go to the gym or if you want to go do sports, that's fine. And then, then you're not reachable anymore. Um, and these kind of points. Hmm? But yeah, in, in general, you'll be working on, on your slides. You'll be working on Excel. You'll be researching. You'll be having meetings with the client where you, where you show your findings or, or ask for information. You'll be having these alignment meetings with your team. And then depending on how much work it is, you'll finish at 7, 8, 9, 10, midnight, whatever. It, it depends on, on whatever is coming up um, or, or later if you're having an unlucky time. But that depends again on your firm and so on. And this is your, your day, usually Monday to Monday to Thursday. Friday is a little bit more casual. Um, and on the weekends, you tend, to, you, you tend to have time to yourself and you tend to not have to work, unlike in investment banking. I'm not sure if that, that answered your question now, but. Mm. No, no, it definitely answers my question. Yeah, Good. thank you. So I see, um, a, I see a raised hand in the chat, but I'm happy to answer yours or Sachin's question, whoever wants to go. Mm. Yeah, Sachin, actually, I was, go yeah. Uh, actually, I was wondering, sir, like, how do you get clients? Because in the real world, like, uh, the companies will not be willing to tell their problems to uh, someone who's in college like there are many uh, big companies around so how do you actually get clients like how do you convince them to tell them your problem okay so um once i can answer this question for the 180 dc context or for the the, the corporate context um i'm not sure which one you meant but i can both both, both both sir both all right um so i'll start with the corporate context there are basically two two ways that this happens um, one is that a company realizes they have an issue. They, uh, sorry, they say our costs are too high or we want to implement this or we want to enter this new market or whatever, we need expertise. And then what they'll do is they'll, they'll, uh, they'll send out an RFP. It's a request for proposal. So what they'll do is they'll take 20 consulting firms and give them a brief overview like, hey, we want to enter the market in Bangladesh or, or whatever. Um, we, we lack the experience. This is what we're thinking of. Um, give us an overview of how would you approach this, this problem. And then here are the firms, and then you get it to BCG and McKinsey and Deloitte and EY and, and all the others, you name them. Um, and then they have, whatever, one, two, three weeks um, to prepare a sort of proposal, which is a, a brief overview of how they would tackle this problem. And this is usually quite, quite intense. And the consultants, they, they work day and night. Um, and you come up with uh, first, you really get into the industry and you make sure you understand as much as possible. Let's say it's a utility company, you understand as much as possible about energy. And then the first part of this proposal that you give out in the end is sort of, hey, you know, we understand who you are, we understand what you do, we can put ourselves in your shoes. And then the second part is, all right, now you want to enter the market in Bangladesh and we will uh, look at, I don't know, energy consumption per capita, current competitors there and this and that and that and so on. Um, and then they say, and you know, we'll be using this and that information. Um, you won't actually do the analysis. You'll just say that's, that's how we'll do it. Um, and in the end you say, okay, and then we come up with a recommendation of how much it will cost you and what the time frame is and what resources you need and so on. Um, and then at the very end, you, you give them the, the, the CVs on some slides about the consultants and the experts you put on the project. And you basically demonstrate, hey, you know, we have a bunch of great people here that already worked in Bangladesh or did projects in energy, or we have an external expert that, I don't know, let some utility company there and, uh, and sort of this. So you say, we understand who you are. This is how we tackle the problem. These are the great people that we have. Then you present this to the client and the client listens to 20 proposals from 20 different firms. And then they say, all right, you know, yours was the most convincing and then they hire you. So that's, that's one way that sort of the official way ships are being built with firms. So for example, BCG here in Dubai, they do a lot of work with the Saudi government. So know each other and they know how the firms work and then they say all right we we have this issue who do we talk to oh you know we've done 20 projects with bcg already so far we've always been satisfied let's approach them find a big firm banging uh, banging out with the with the leadership team at the at the client side and then that is how they they find together those are usually the two ways and often there's also a combination. You may be obliged to put out a request for proposal because your bylaw stated, 
but in the end you already know you're going to pick one of the three firms that you've worked with in the past that you're you're quite happy with so this relationship building is, is super important at the higher levels in the consultancy so but you're they're not going to go like, oh, you know, we have this issue and we're going to put it in the newspaper, show everybody in the world uh, and then hope like a consultancy can help us here. All of this is obviously super confidential. So you're, you're, you're not allowed, to, like I'm not allowed to tell you what I'm working on right now. Um, it's very, it, it's highly confidential. And then yeah, the firms are actually quite open about the problems that they have. And then it's, it's key that no competitor finds out about it. And obviously, if you're, uh, if you're a firm that already consults their competitor, you're not allowed to use this information, not allowed to see it, not allowed to do a project with them, and so on. So it is confidential enough that you don't need to worry about your, your private information getting out. Um, now, at 180DC, it's a little bit trickier. Mm. And this was one of the, the problems that we faced in Barcelona as well. Um, because, of course, you're known, but the small startups or the NGOs, they, they don't think about, oh, do we hire a pro bono consultancy here? So um, what we did then was we just reached out to uh, a lot of a lot of small firms and networks and uh, there are impact investment networks everywhere and so on in Barcelona, in the region, in our hometowns. And we said, hey, you know, we're 180DC. Um, we do this and that. Would you be interested in doing a project with us? And that's one side. And, some clients do actually come to us and say, hey, we heard about you or, you know, the, the, they're connected in their networks as well. And then they say, oh, yeah, we know uh, you did a project with those guys and I'm friends with the founder. And, you know, we'd also like to like to do one with you. That happens, but it happens somewhat rarely, especially if you're in, if you're a relatively new branch. So if you're established in the region, then you may have your your clients already. Um, a third way is that you did a project with them before. We had like a big client in Barcelona that won ATDC. When I was a team lead, we did three projects with them. And now in the year after, they already knew us. And then we did two, two follow-up projects. So one might be we develop a marketing strategy for them in the first year. And then in the second year, we help with the implementation. And the fourth one is just personal contacts. So you have people on your teams. So you have people on the board. Um, they have friends who may have founded a company. They have parents who know others to work for an NGO um, and so on, or they did an internship somewhere, that was the case for one of us. Um, and then you reach out through this informal line of communication and they say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm at 180 now, would you like to do a project? And then, then it happens like this, but it takes time. And this, this business development is one of the, the big challenges. And I hope I, I managed to comprehensively answer the entire question here. Yes, sir. thank you. My pleasure. All right, more questions. I think you're muted, Aishwarya. Yeah. Sorry, sir. So uh, how could you make the most of the one with this experience? Like what should be our thought process and how we should build all the skills to one? Um, interesting question. Mm -hmm. Probably the most important thing is to be engaged um, in the process. So don't see it as a, well, I signed up for it. Now I kind of have to do it. And in the end, I want to put it on my CV, but really let's just get it over with when, when you're not getting anything from it. You know, be engaged, um, try to really make the most out of it in the way that you want to deliver the best possible result. And you want to go out of your way to really add value to the client here. Mm. Um, this from the, the professional view. Um, the other one is, you know, go in there with an open mind. So really go there with the, with the objective to learn as much as you can. So say I have diverse teammates now. Um, I, want to, I want to see how they work. I want to, to understand them better. I don't just want to, you know, see them as a colleague that we produce output together, but, but see them as an opportunity to get to know another person and find out about their ways of working and maybe their culture. Um, same with the client. Go there with an open mind. Don't go there thinking, okay, you know, we listen to your problems and we provide a solution. Try to really understand what they do. Try to, to understand what moves them. Put yourself in their shoes. Um, and then you'll get, get much further also in delivering the value that you have there. And then finally, um, so see it as an opportunity to add value. See it as a learning opportunity. And then see it as a, as a networking opportunity as well. So go in there and say, I'm, I'm here to, to meet people. I'm here to make friends. These might be valuable connections later on in my life. You know, we'll go on to work in great firms and do great things and found wonderful startups. And then it's 
then it's good to know them. So I'd say these, these three components really help. Um, and obviously, you need to invest more time and effort into it than to, to make it happen. And perhaps the fourth one is we organized some events in Barcelona as well. So there would be someone coming in from the outside and they'd give a lecture about how consulting works in the social sector, or they'd give a, a lecture on project management um, or talk about talk about anything. And these were voluntary, so nobody was forced to join. But if you, if you learned more about the industry, the business, you met more people. So do the voluntary stuff as well, not just not just the one of the stuff you committed to. Yeah, so that was really well summed up. Um, any more questions from the audience? Anyone will ask a question? Yeah, I would like to ask something like, can you tell us a bit about the hierarchy of an ITDC that how can a person grow and how does that person's responsibility increases? Okay. Um, yeah. This is, it depends a little bit on what branch you're in and how big they are, because in the end there's some, there's some flexibility. So one ATDC global, I, I didn't have much, we didn't have that much to do with the global, you know, umbrella organization, but they're not going to tell you, you have to do it in this way, or you have to do it in that way. There'll probably be some guidelines um, and there'll be a more or less standard way of doing it. Um, but in the end, there, there's flexibility. I think what you told me, if you have uh, five board members and five consultants, when it doesn't make sense to, to have a hierarchy with, with 10 different levels when you try to, you try to keep it flat. Um, in general, that would be my suggestion is you, you keep the hierarchies flat even if you grow it as an organization and you make sure that even the, the president, vice president are approachable by, by anyone um, and that there's, that there's not this, this disconnect between, between people. Then about how the hierarchy usually works and, um, at, the, at the bottom level it sounds wrong when I say bottom level, but I, I don't mean it in that way. Um, you have the consultants. Um, they are led by their team leads. And these team leads report to the consulting directors who, who sit on the board. And then on the board, it's led or by the president, vice president, or co-presidents, or, or just one president, whatever you want to call it. So they're sort of, and then the board, you have the consulting directors responsible for all the, the consulting stuff. Then we had a marketing director responsible for the internal, they have their own team, of course, responsible for the marketing efforts of the organization. Um, we had a sort of community director. Um, she and her team were responsible for organizing the events, for doing the recruiting, um, all these kind of things. We had a, a business development director and a business development team. They were the ones approaching clients and pulling in the projects. We had a strategy director. They were focusing on developing the, the new initiatives to, to push 180 forward and to, to think about in which direction to grow. And they all had their, their teams as well. So that's the, the rough hierarchy. And then very briefly about the responsibilities. If you're a consultant, like I explained before, you're usually responsible for one part of the, the project analysis and for delivering it at the, end, at the end. If you're a team lead, you're responsible that for your team and that your, your consultants, that they, they all work and you, you double check their work and you, you give feedback and you add value there and so on. And you report to your consulting director and the consulting director will have anything between two and let's say six, it really, it depends. Um, projects that they're supervising um, and their responsibility is right at the start to talk to the client, to set up the team, um, to introduce team and client, and then periodically sort of check in, make sure that everything is going well, that there are no problems to, to give feedback on deliverables to all, all this kind of stuff. And then they in turn report to the board um, just like all the other directors report. So we had a, a weekly board meeting where everybody sort of said, okay, and like in my department, this and that is going on and this is the progress that we made and hey, we need some help here. Um, and then finally, if you want to call it the top, uh, the president, presidents um, responsible for, for running the organization, for doing the organ organizing the board, um, but also for being the the, 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 the faces of the organization, let's call it like this. So they were the ones who negotiated with the university about funding. Um, they were the ones who represented 180 DC in, 
I don't know, whatever social conventions events, um, when there were partnerships with other 180 DC branches, when, you know, the presidents would be the ones to initiate them before the sort of the, the, the team leads or the, the consulting directors on the ground would get involved. So um, this is roughly the, the different levels. And of course, as you grow, um, you may have you may add more steps, but in my opinion, this is enough to support even a, a very large branch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. We will be taking last question for the session since we are on a time crunch here. So anyone from the audience would like to ask and ask. I would like to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Thank you so much for this insightful session. I wanted to know more about the selection process of MVP firms after uh, after under after graduation, uh, after posting masters, especially. Are MBAs given more preference, or are masters in management given equal preference? Is there any preference or selection criteria these firms are looking out for? There was a bit of a cut there, but it was about how MBB select and hire, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to know if there was any selection criteria after master. They are looking okay. up. Um, I mean, they will write on their websites what they're looking for, but they don't have any strict selection criteria. So they don't go, I mean, how do you say this? They, they don't go, somebody must fulfill all these requirements and if they fulfill all these requirements then we're going to invite them to an interview and if they don't fulfill these requirements then then we're not going to invite them um they have their, their cv screening process which is really intransparent and you don't really know what makes the difference between why one person gets invited and another person doesn't um in the end their their criteria are if you come from a target university so from one that's that's ranked highly then that gives you an added benefit if you have good grades, so let's say you're in the top 10% of your class, then, then that's an added benefit. And, um, if you have previous uh, consulting experience, so you've either done like multiple internships in smaller consultancies or, or tier three, tier four firms, big four, whatever, um, then they obviously look on that positively. If you've done an internship at another MBB, which is unlikely if you're if you're applying there, or at a at a tier two firm, let's say Strategy End, Roland Burger, Kearney, whatever, um, then they look at that very positively because they know they don't have to teach you everything from the start, but you already you already bring a lot of stuff with you. Um, and if you, this is the hardest part to okay, I I can add have has done some social work, has done some volunteering, engaged himself, post like. Uh, just getting good grades and getting getting professional experience, but has done something extra. But then there's sort of this, it's hard to define and it, they, they don't tell you much about it. Like you have to be interesting in a way, you have to be special. If you're just the, the standard candidate, they go, you might get invited. But in the end, you know, some people here, they, they, they were, they had like worked for a year as a professional musician, or they did this and that, and they have this special talent or this amazing hobby or, or whatever, and you write about it in your cover letter, um, and then they go, "Wow, this person!" It just—they just have a little extra. They're, they're more unique, um, and they always say that this is a, a big difference maker for them. To, I can't, I can't, I really, I can't tell you how they evaluate this, um, and it's not absolutely crucial that you have this, but it's just find something that makes you unique and that makes you special and that differentiates you from everyone else who's who's got internships and good grades. Um, then, then that makes a difference about the MBA part. So how, how it works is that uh, if you join post MBA, you join on a different level. So for example, I'll be starting here with BCG like after the internship full-time in October as an associate. Um, and if you have a master's degree, you start as an associate or at McKinsey, they call it business analyst at Bain. I, I don't even know. Um, and then after anything between 1.5 and 2.5 years you get promoted to become a consultant if you join post mba then you start straight away on the consultant level so you skip these these two years at the start so after a master's degree you won't compete for the same slots with the mbas so you don't need to think oh you know like an mba they're they're more special or i can't i can't outrank them in that way mm -hmm. they just apply for a different higher position mm -hmm. Right. Thank you so much for answering that. 
you're very welcome. Okay, we will wrapping up the session right now. Cool. So thank you, Mr. Lucas, for this insightful session. Thank you for taking time out on a Friday afternoon. I'm sure all of us present today have gained a clearer view of Onity DC. And our future consultants present today are pumped up to be a part of Onity DC family soon. And I would like to thank Pooja ma'am and Kanupriya ma'am for always supporting us. And last but not the least, thank you to all the participants today for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you also from my side. I had some fun and it was wonderful to get to know you all. I think it's great that you're starting your 180 branch there. And if you want to add me on LinkedIn after the session, let's let's connect, let's stay in touch. And if you have more questions, then just, just text me there and I'll see what I can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you so much for that. Uh, all are requested to switch on the cameras we will take a screenshot of photos of the session. Yeah, Omi, please take this screenshot.